Today, we take for granted the fact that the brain is the seat of psychological activity. When we struggle with a difficult homework problem, we say that our brains hurt. When we consult with friends for advice about a complicated question, we pick their brains. And when we insult others' intelligence, we call them bird brains. Yet throughout much of human history, it seemed obvious that the brain wasn't the prime location for our thoughts, memories, and emotions. For example, the ancient Egyptians believed that the heart was the seat of the human soul, and the brain was irrelevant to mental life. Although some ancient Greeks correctly pinpointed the brain as the source of the psyche, others, like the great philosopher Aristotle, were convinced that the brain functions merely as a radiator, cooling the heart when it becomes overheated. Even today, we can find holdovers of this way of thinking in our everyday language. When we memorize something, we come to know it by heart. When we're devastated by the loss of a romantic relationship, we feel heartbroken. Why were so many of the ancients certain that the heart, not the brain, was the source of mental activity? It's almost surely because they trusted their common sense, which as we have learned is often a poor signpost of scientific truth. They noticed that when people became excited, angry, or scared, their hearts pounded quickly, whereas their brains seemed to do little or nothing. Therefore, they reasoned the heart must be the a causal mechanism for these emotional reactions. By confusing correlation with causation, the ancients' intuitions misled them. Today we recognize that the mushy organ lying between our two ears is by far the most complicated structure in the known universe. Our brain has the consistency of gelatin and it weighs a mere three pounds. Despite its rather unimpressive appearance, it is capable of astonishing feats. In recent decades, scientists have made numerous technological strides that have taught us a great deal about how our brains work. Researchers who study the relationship between the nervous system and behavior go by the names of biological psychologists or neuroscientists. Neuroscience is the scientific study of the brain and the nervous system. An intriguing puzzle is trying to understand how our brain functions. We know it depends on crosstalk among neurons, nerve cells that are specialized for communication with each other. Our brains contain about 100 billion neurons. To give you a sense of how enormous this number is, there are more than 15 times as many neurons in our brains as there are people on Earth. What's more, many neurons forge tens of thousands of connections with other neurons, permitting a staggering amount of intercellular communication. Connectome refers to the complex interconnected network of neurons in your brain. The wiring of the brain is staggeringly complex. Our own brains have tens of billions of neurons connected through perhaps 100 trillion synapses. This circuitry is the result of our development and experience. The neural activity that courses through and alters it somehow accounts for our thoughts, our behavior, our memories. 100 years from now, this brain circuitry will probably be known. Uh, today, for the first time though, we can contemplate mapping our neural architecture in detail. New forms of electron microscopes allow high resolution imaging of connectomes, that is, complete neural wiring diagrams. Many people with serious brain illnesses have some abnormality in the connections of the brain. Until recently, researchers did not have the scanning methods to detect or map the connections in the brain. The Human Connectome Project plans to do for the brain what the Human Genome Project did for genetics. Mapping the human brain is one of the great scientific challenges of the 21st century. The Human Connectome Project is mapping the connections between neural pathways that underlie brain and behavior. The Human Connectome Project plans to do for the brain what the Human Genome Project did for genetics. Mapping the human brain is one of the great scientific challenges of the 21st century. The Human Connectome Project is mapping the connections between neural pathways that underlie brain function and behavior.
While the Human Connectome Project is very much a work in progress, it is yielding some exciting results. A recent study by Connectome researchers published in the journal Science revealed that the brain's neurons are not the haphazard tangle that some had thought but are arranged in clearly defined pathways. And you can see some of their results right here. Here's a frontal view of the left and right hemispheres as connected by the corpus callosum. And here's a side view of the brain's left hemisphere, including the cerebrum and cerebellum. The findings of this project will help transform our understanding of the human mind and brain in health and in disease. This project will ultimately yield invaluable information about brain connectivity and its relationship to behavior and the contributions of genetic and environmental factors on individual differences in brain circuitry and behavior. Researchers hope to use this data to explore how a brain's connectivity relates to his or her mental abilities, including memory, self-control, and decision making. In this module, we'll take a look first at the neuron and the structure of the neuron, how neurons communicate, and get a better understanding of the neurotransmitters, the uh, chemical messengers, which facilitate communication between neurons. Then we'll look at the nervous system and the endocrine system. Then the brain, and we'll get a better understanding of the hierarchical structure of the nervous system processing in the cerebral cortex and specializations in the left and right hemispheres. This lecture will just briefly highlight some of the main concepts in your reading. Now you are still responsible for taking the time to carefully read and study this chapter. Neurons are responsible for information transmission throughout the nervous system. They are individual cells that receive, integrate, and transmit information. They are the basic links that permit communication within the nervous system. Glia are cells found throughout the nervous system that provide various types of support for neurons. Glia literally means glue and they tend to be much smaller than neurons. Glial cells serve many functions. For example, they supply nourishment to neurons, help remove neurons waste products, and provide insulation around many axons. The myelin sheaths that encase some axons are derived from special types of glial cells. Until recently, it was thought that the transmission and integration of information signals was the exclusive role of the neurons. However, newer research has demonstrated that glial cells also play an important role in information processing. Let's look more closely at the structure of a neuron. Dendrites include fibers that project out of the cell body, receiving information from other neurons. Neurons differ from other cells in these branch-like extensions for receiving information from other neurons. The cell body contains the nucleus of the cell and other biological machinery to keep cells alive. The cell body, also called the soma, is the central region of the neuron. The axon transmits messages through the neuron. Axons are long tail-like extensions uh, protruding from the cell body. The axon terminal is a knob-like structure at the far end of the axon. Axon terminals in turn contain synaptic vesicles, these tiny spheres that contain neurotransmitters, chemical messengers that neurons use to communicate with each other. Putting this all together, we can see very basically how a neuron works. The dendrites receive information from other neurons and pass it along to the cell body. The cell body decides whether the information should be passed on to other neurons. If it decides it should, then it does so by means of an electrical impulse that travels down the axon, the longer thin fiber coming out of the cell body. The pictured neuron has a myelinated axon. Please note that there are periodic gaps where there is no myelin. Now these gaps facilitate uh, faster transmission of the electrical impulse. The impulse jumps down from one gap to the next down the axon. And when the impulse reaches the axon terminals or the end of the axon, it triggers 
chemical communication with other neurons. An important concept is that communication within neurons is electrical and communication between neurons is chemical. Neurons respond to neurotransmitters by generating electrical activity. We know this because scientists have recorded electrical activity from neurons using electrodes. Now, these electrodes allow them to measure the potential difference in uh, electrical charge inside versus uh, outside the neuron. Now, when the electrical charge inside the neuron reaches a high enough level relative to the outside, called the threshold, an action potential occurs. Action potentials are abrupt waves of electrical discharge triggered by a change in the charge inside the axon. When this change occurs, we can describe the neuron as firing, and it releases neurochemicals at the axon terminal. Some of the neurotransmitters or neurochemicals released at the axon terminal will reach a dendrite or another uh, neuron. Now, information from the dendrites is either excitatory, telling the neuron to generate an electrical impulse, or inhibitory, telling the neuron not to generate an electrical impulse. The impulse is an all or nothing event, meaning that there either is or is not an electrical impulse. Stimuli of varying intensities are encoded by the quantity of neurons generating impulses and by the number of impulses generated each second by the neurons. Neurotransmitters are contained in the axon terminals. They are naturally occurring chemicals in the nervous system, which specialize in transmitting information between neurons. Most neurons are interlinked in complex, dense networks. In fact, a neuron may receive a symphony of signals from thousands of other neurons. That same neuron may pass its messages along to thousands of other neurons as well. Thus, a neuron must do a great deal more than simply relay messages it receives. It must integrate excitatory and inhibitory signals arriving at many synapses before it decides whether to fire a neural impulse or not. Our perceptions, thoughts, and actions depend on patterns of neural activity in elaborate, widely distributed neural networks. These networks consist of interconnected neurons that frequently fire either together or sequentially to perform certain functions. The synaptic gap, or synapse, is a small gap across which neurotransmitters are sent, allowing neurons to communicate. They're found between the axon terminals of one neuron and the dendrites of another neuron. Whereas electrical events transmit information within neurons, chemical events initiated by neurotransmitters orchestrate communication among neurons. After neurotransmitter molecules are released into the synapse, they bind with receptor sites along the dendrites of neighboring neurons. Different receptor sites recognize different types of neurotransmitters. Researchers typically use a lock and key analogy to describe this specificity. We can think of each neurotransmitter as a key that fits only its own type of receptor or lock. Neurotransmission can be halted by reuptake of the neurotransmitter back into the axon terminal, a process by which uh, the synaptic vesicle reabsorbs the neurotransmitter. Neurons communicate with each other chemically. As explained in this figure, there are three steps. First, when the electrical impulse in a neuron reaches the axon terminals, it causes neurotransmitter molecules in the terminal vesicles to be released into the synaptic gap between neurons. Two, these molecules cross the gap and fit into receptor sites on the dendrites of other neurons, thereby carrying their messages. And three, the neurotransmitter molecules then go back into the gap where they're either taken up by the sending neuron, this is called reuptake, to be used again, or they are destroyed by enzymes. We can think of release and reuptake of the neurotransmitter as analogous to letting some liquid drip out of the bottom of a straw, the release, and then sucking it back up again, reuptake. Reuptake is one of nature's recycling mechanisms. Let's look at some neurotransmitters. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that plays roles in arousal, selective attention, sleep, and memory. 
in the neurological disorder of Alzheimer's disease, neurons containing acetylcholine and several other neurotransmitters are progressively destroyed, leading to severe memory loss. Medications that alleviate some of the symptoms of Alzheimer's, like the drug Aricept, boost acetylcholine levels in the brain. Dopamine plays a major role in reward-motivated behavior and are involved in motor control and the release of several hormones. Low levels are associated with Parkinson's disease. Excessively high levels of dopamine are associated with schizophrenia. Serotonin and norepinephrine are involved in levels of arousal and mood and play a major role in mood disorders, such as depression. Now, SSRIs are antidepressant drugs that work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin, uh, leaving more of that neurotransmitter available in the synaptic gap. Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft are some SSRIs. SNRIs are antidepressant drugs that work by blocking the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, and they include Cymbalta and Effexor. Glutamate and GABA are uh, the most common uh, neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. Neurons in virtually every brain area use these neurotransmitters to communicate with each other. Glutamate rapidly excites neurons, increasing the likelihood that they'll communicate with other neurons. The release of glutamate is associated with enhanced learning and memory. When elevated, glutamate may also contribute to schizophrenia and other mental disorders because in high doses, it can be toxic, damaging neural receptors by overstimulating them. GABA, in contrast, inhibits neurons, thereby dampening neural activity. That's why most anti-anxiety drugs bind to GABA receptors. GABA is a workhorse in our nervous system uh, playing critical roles in learning, memory, and sleep. Scientists are intrigued by the promise of drugs that target GABA to one day treat a variety of conditions, including uh, insomnia, depression, and epilepsy. And finally, endorphins are neurotransmitters. They're naturally occurring. They trigger the brain's reward centers, causing release of dopamine, and they are involved in pain perception and relief. There is a table in this chapter which covers uh, neurotransmitters and some of their functions, and I encourage you to uh, study this closely. Moving on to the second section of this lecture, we'll look at the nervous system and its major subdivisions. The nervous system first divides into the central nervous system, the spinal cord and the brain, and the peripheral nervous system, the remainder of the nervous system throughout the body. The peripheral nervous system has two parts, the somatic or skeletal nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system also has two parts, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Here we can more clearly see the nervous system and its major subdivisions. First, the nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, CNS, and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is comprised of the brain, which is the control center for the entire nervous system, and the spinal cord, which connects the brain and the PNS and enables spinal reflexes. The peripheral nervous system is divided into the somatic nervous system, which is the conduit for incoming sensory input and outgoing commands from the brain to skeletal muscles. And the other part is the autonomic nervous system, which is uh, the part of the nervous system that controls the involuntary actions of our organs and glands. Along with the limbic system, it helps to regulate our emotions. The uh, autonomic nervous system, in turn, consists of two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic. These two divisions work in opposing directions so that when one is active, the other is passive. The sympathetic nervous system is active during emotional arousal, especially during crises. The system mobilizes the fight-or-flight response described by Walter Cannon in 1929. Cannon noticed that when we encounter threats, like the sight of a huge predator charging toward us, our sympathetic nervous system becomes aroused and prepares us for fighting or fleeing. 
Sympathetic activation triggers a variety of physical responses helpful for reacting in a crisis, including increased heart rate, allowing for uh, more blood to flow to our extremities, uh, respiration, uh, and increased perspiration. Autonomic nerves that reach the heart, diaphragm, and sweat glands control these reactions. The parasympathetic nervous system, in contrast, is active during our rest and digest periods. The system uh, kicks into gear when there is no threat on our mental radar screens. Now there are three types of neurons in the nervous system. First, interneurons integrate information within the CNS through their communication with each other and between sensory and motor neurons in the spinal cord. Sensory neurons carry information to the central nervous system from the sensory receptors, muscles, and glands. And motor neurons, which carry movement commands from the central nervous system to the rest of the body. The major way the brain communicates with the rest of the body is through the nervous system. However, the body has a second communication system that is also important to behavior. The endocrine system consists of glands that secrete chemicals into the bloodstream that help control bodily functioning. The messengers in this communication network are called hormones. Hormones are the chemical substances released by the endocrine glands. In a way, hormones are much like neurotransmitters in the nervous system, but they can't match the high speed of neural transmission, and they tend to be less specific, as they often act on many target cells throughout the body. The uh, major uh, endocrine glands and their functions are shown in this figure from the text. Hormone release tends to be pulsatile. That is, hormones tend to be released several times per day in brief bursts that last only a few minutes. Much of the endocrine system is controlled by the nervous system through the hypothalamus. Uh, this structure at the base of the forebrain has intimate connections with the pea-sized pituitary gland to which it is adjacent. The pituitary gland releases a great variety of hormones that fan out within the body, stimulating actions in the other endocrine glands. In this sense, the pituitary is the master gland of the endocrine system, although the hypothalamus is the real power uh, behind the throne. Psychologists have wondered how our complex neurological system gives rise to emotions. Well, emotion is a complex psychological state, which involves a physical component, a behavioral component, and a cognitive component. The physical component involves the autonomic nervous system triggering physiological arousal, which uh, includes the fight or flight response of the autonomic nervous system, uh, such as an increase in heart rate and breathing, blood pressure surges, sweating, pupil dilation, and slowing of digestion. The behavioral component is the outward behavioral expression of the emotion and is the product of motor neurons. It also involves the facial feedback hypothesis, which assumes that the facial muscles send messages to the brain, allowing the brain to determine which emotion is being experienced. The cognitive component uh, involves cognitive appraisal of the situation to determine the specific emotion and its intensity. Several theories of emotion have been proposed over the years and they provide some different explanations. But in order to uh, integrate the theories, we uh, look at Joseph Ledoux, who proposes that there are different brain systems for different emotions. Some emotional responses might be the product of a brain system that operates as a reflex system without any cognitive appraisal. For example, fear does not require higher level cognitive processing and is generated almost instantaneously by the amygdala. Now, love or guilt do not require instantaneous responding for survival, and they may require higher level processing. They may require using a brain system that relies on cognitive appraisal and the use of past emotional experiences in this appraisal. The final section of this lecture covers the brain. Despite having so much information available today regarding the relationship between the brain and behavior, scores of misconceptions about the brain abound. One is the myth that the brain is gray in color. 
Well, actually, the living brain is a mixture of white, red, pink, and black in colors. The other myth, which was around for a long time, is that we only use about 10% of our brain's capacity. Contrary to popular psychology, neuroimaging studies have shown that we use most and even all of our brain capacity virtually all of the time. No one's ever discovered any perpetually silent areas of the brain, nor is it the case that 90% of the brain produces nothing of psychological interest when stimulated. All brain areas become active on brain scans at one time or another as we think, feel, and perceive. The brainstem is the central core of the brain. It has the medulla, which links the spinal cord to the brain and is involved in regulating heartbeat, blood pressure, digestion, and swallowing. The reticular formation is a network of neurons running up the center of the brainstem and into the thalamus that is involved in controlling our different levels of awareness and arousal. The cerebellum is involved in the coordination of our movements, our sense of balance, and motor and procedural learning. The thalamus, located at the top of the brain stem, serves as a relay station for incoming sensory information except smell. The basal ganglia are on the outer sides of the thalamus and are concerned mainly with the initiation and execution of physical movements. Here's a diagram from the text, which is a visual representation of the uh, location of the central core brain structures that I just covered. Uh, you'll want to note that the hippocampus and amygdala are limbic system structures. The limbic system is a loosely connected network of structures located roughly along the border between the cerebral cortex and deeper subcortical areas. The limbic system is not a well-defined anatomical system with clear boundaries. Broadly speaking, it includes parts of the uh, hypothalamus, the uh, hippocampus, and the amygdala. The hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland, as we mentioned, the autonomic nervous system, and uh, plays a major role in regulating basic drives, such as eating, thirst, and sex. The hippocampus is involved in the formation of memories and generates new memories through neurogenesis, or the creation of new neurons. The amygdala plays a major role in regulating our emotional experiences, especially fear, anger, and aggression. The uh, limbic system is positioned around the top of the brain stem, and here is a visual representation of the uh, location of these structures, and you can see where the pituitary gland is in relationship to these uh, brain structures. The cerebrum is the largest and most complex part of the human brain. It includes brain areas that are responsible for our most complex mental activities, including learning, remembering, thinking, and consciousness itself. The cerebral cortex is the convoluted outer layer of the cerebrum. It's the most important brain structure. It's the information processing center for the nervous system. It's the center for all higher level cognitive processing and the site of hemispheric communication. The cerebral cortex of the human brain is very crumpled and this allows for more cortical surface area to fit inside our rather small skull. The actual surface area, if unfolded, is about the size of four sheets of notebook paper. The cerebral cortex consists of two hemispheres connected by a band of neurons called the corpus callosum, allowing for the two hemispheres to communicate. Anatomically, there are four cerebral lobes, and each lobe contains an area of specialized function. The frontal lobe includes the motor cortex, which allows us to move the different parts of our body. The parietal lobe includes the somatosensory cortex, where our body sensations of touch, temperature, limb position, and pain are processed. The temporal lobe is involved in primary auditory perception, such as hearing, and holds the primary auditory cortex. The primary auditory cortex receives sensory information from the ears, and secondary areas process the information into meaningful units, such as speech and words. And the occipital lobe includes the primary visual cortex, where visual sensory information is initially processed.
This figure shows the four lobes in the left hemisphere. They are exactly the same areas in the right hemisphere. The central fissure separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe, and the temporal lobe is located beneath the lateral fissure running along the side of the hemisphere. The occipital lobe is toward the lower back of the hemisphere. The motor cortex is the strip in the frontal lobe directly in front of the central fissure. The somatosensory cortex is the strip in the parietal lobe directly behind the central fissure and primary auditory processing occurs in the temporal lobe. Primary visual processing occurs in the occipital lobe. As mentioned, the frontal lobe strip of the cortex is the motor cortex, which allows movement in different parts of the body. Each hemisphere controls voluntary movement of the opposite side of the body. This is a contralateral relationship. The amount of motor cortex devoted to a specific body part is related to the complexity and precision of movement of which that part is capable. The parietal lobe strip of the cortex is the somatosensory cortex, where body sensations of pressure, temperature, limb position, and pain are processed. There is a contralateral relationship with the body, meaning that the left hemisphere strip perceives sensations from the right side of the body, and the right hemisphere strip perceives uh, sensations from the left side of the body. The amount of sensory motor cortex devoted to a body part is directly proportionate to the sensitivity of that body part. These are homunculi for the left hemisphere. This means that the motor strip controls the right side of the body, and the somatosensory strip receives signals from the right side of the body. Also notice the amount of space devoted to the highly sensitive areas of the face and mouth. For both strips, the body is arranged from foot to head starting at the top of the hemisphere. The association cortex consists of the other 70% of the cortex not in one of the previously mentioned areas. All areas mentioned require integration of various types of information. Synesthesia involves a rare neurological condition in which otherwise normal people have cross-sensory experiences, in which stimulation in one modality leads to automatic and voluntary experiences in another modality. Synesthesia is loosely defined as senses coming together, which is just a translation of the Greek. At its simplest level, synesthesia means that when a certain sense or part of a sense is activated, another unrelated sense or part of a sense is activated concurrently. For example, when someone hears a sound, he or she immediately sees a color or shape in his or her mind's eye. Synesthesia is not a disease or a disorder. In fact, several researchers at Boston University have shown that these individuals can perform better on certain tests of memory and intelligence, and synesthesia does not mean the person is mentally ill. Uh, these individuals test negative on scales that check for schizophrenia, psychosis, delusions, and other disorders. The importance of the association cortex can be seen in language. Broca's area is a region of the frontal lobe of the left hemisphere. Now, this area was identified as being involved in the production of speech by a French surgeon, Pierre Paul Broca, in 1861. Broca described a patient who had lost the use of speech but was still able to comprehend spoken language and communicate with hand gestures. On autopsy, the patient was found to have a lesion in what is now known as Broca's area. Wernicke's area is associated with other aspects of language and is named after the German physician Karl Wernicke. In 1864, Wernicke described a patient who was able to speak but unable to comprehend language. The patient was found to have a lesion in the posterior region of the temporal lobe known as Wernicke's area. Without information from both of these areas, being integrated, people suffer from speech and language dysfunctions, also known as aphasias. 
As we've noted, the cerebrum is divided into two separate hemispheres. Recent decades have seen an exciting flurry of research on the specialized abilities of the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Some theorists have gone so far as to suggest that people really have uh, two brains in one. Hints of this hemispheric specialization have been available for many years from cases in which one side of a person's brain has been damaged. The uh, left hemisphere was implicated in the control of language as early as 1861 with the discovery of Broca's area. Evidence that the left hemisphere usually processes language led scientists to characterize it as the dominant hemisphere. Because thoughts are usually coded in terms of language, the left hemisphere was given the lion's share of credit for handling the higher mental processes. Meanwhile, the right hemisphere came to be viewed as the non-dominant or a dumb hemisphere, if you will, lacking any special functions uh, or abilities. Now, research uh, into the uh, characterizations of the right and left hemispheres uh, as major and minor partners in uh, the brain's work began to change in the 1960s. It all started with landmark research by Roger Sperry, Michael Gazaniga, and uh, Paul Bogan, as uh, discussed uh, in this chapter. In split brain surgery, the bundles of fibers that connect the cerebral hemispheres, the corpus callosum, is cut to reduce the severity of epileptic seizures. It's a radical procedure that is chosen only in exceptional cases that have not responded to other forms of treatment. But the surgery provides scientists with an unusual opportunity to study people who have had their brains literally split in two. Now, to appreciate the logic of split brain research, you need to understand how sensory and motor information is routed to and from the two hemispheres. Each hemisphere's primary connections are to the opposite side of the body. Thus, the left hemisphere controls and communicates with the right hand, right arm, right leg, right eyebrow, and so on. In contrast, the right hemisphere controls and communicates with the left side of the body. Now, vision and hearing are much more complex. And to uh, just to give you an idea, let's take a look at the pathways for processing information in the left and right visual fields. Both eyes deliver information to both hemispheres, but input is still separated. Now, half of the fibers from each eye cross over at the optic chasm to go to the opposite hemisphere. Stimuli in the right half of the visual field are registered by receptors on the left side of each eye, which send signals to the left hemisphere. Stimuli in the left half of the visual field are transmitted to both eyes to the right hemisphere. Auditory inputs to each ear also go to uh, both hemispheres. However, connections to the opposite hemisphere are stronger or more immediate. That is, sounds presented to the right ear are registered in the left hemisphere first, while sounds presented to the left ear are registered more quickly in the right hemisphere. Split-brained people are unable to uh, transfer information between the hemispheres because the corpus callosum has been severed. They can only identify information orally when it is presented briefly in the right visual field and thus processing in the left hemisphere. If a spoon was flashed in the left visual field, split-brained people could not say that it was a spoon. If the person was blindfolded and told to find the object from a group of objects with the left hand, he or she can do this. This is because information from the somatic sensory receptors is transmitted to the central nervous system through neural pathways that do not cross over to the other side of the body until they reach the medulla. At this point, what we know about uh, hemispheric specialization or lateralization is the left hemisphere seems involved in language, uh, math and logic skills. It's more analytical, uh, analyzing holes into pieces. And the right hemisphere is involved in spatial perception, solving spatial problems, uh, drawing and face recognition. But is it accurate to say someone is left-brained or right-brained? Well, we'll explore this in a discussion question this week. 
let's move on and take a look at what happens when we sleep. Consciousness is a person's subjective awareness of both their inner thinking and feeling and their external environment. Now, an electroencephalogram, EEG, records a real-time graph of a person's cortical electrical activity in the brain. As we slip into sleep and pass through the first four stages, our brain waves change, in general, becoming progressively slower, larger, and more irregular, especially in stages three and four. I'm going to uh, conclude this lecture with the five stages of sleep, which may be appropriate, but hopefully you haven't reached stage five at this point of the lecture. Stage one lasts about five minutes, and, and you can see the various stages of sleep indicated by the changes in the brain waves in the EEG recordings on the right. Stage two lasts about 20 minutes. It's characterized by sleep spindles, rapid bursts of mental activity. Stage three is also known as transitional sleep and is characterized by delta waves, which are large, slow waves. Stage four lasts about 30 minutes where the parasympathetic nervous system is active. As muscles relax, the heartbeat slows, blood pressure declines, and digestion speeds up. Stage five is rapid eye movement sleep, REM, which occurs after we leave stage four. And after REM, we return through the earlier stages of sleep. It's called uh, paradoxical sleep because your muscles are relaxed, but other body sy systems, including the brain, are active, much like a waking pattern. It's characterized by very rapid brain waves, somewhat like those of stage one sleep, but one is still sound asleep. If awakened during REM sleep, people often report having been dreaming, and most dreams are emotional and unpleasant perhaps because the visual cortex and the frontal lobe are inactive during REM sleep. The limbic system structures are active, however, creating irrational imagery and emotional experiences of our dream world. REM sleep accounts for 20 to 25% of total sleep time.